sir you are live you can start uh very good evening everyone again we welcome you to isc master class as you are aware that uh, indian society of gastroenterology is organizing uh, master classes for residents and and all the gastroenterologists in our country till now it have we have done four uh, lectures in this series and all four have been uh, quite successful we had a audience varying from 1500 to 2000 in each of these uh, uh, webinars we have also posted a feedback form uh, three days back i hope you received it and i'm sure that some of you have already responded to and we'll wait for a couple of days uh, before we receive all the responses and get back to you what, what was our observations and what suggestions uh, you gave us we also request you to please post uh, uh, your feedback uh, in terms of quality in terms of uh, uh, the audio visual effect in terms of uh, uh, speakers and their contents uh, that will help us improving the quality of these webinars as i said earlier that we intend to continue with these webinars in the future also even we uh, come out of this lockdown state one more i point i want to highlight at this point of time that uh, while we are in the uh, midst of this uh, uh, pandemic but everybody in the pandemic is uh, working governments uh, media organizations scientific societies and everyone is working hard uh, to get over this crisis and I, we believe that uh, this is the best phase of humanity one has ever seen everyone is uh, uh, so decent and, and so supportive that we are able to fight this pandemic uh, all over the world and we believe that by this pandemic the whole world has come much closer so with this uh, basic introduction let me also uh, welcome dr sovna bhatia uh she has consented to moderate this session and all of us know dr bhatia uh, he is a very renowned teacher and renowned gastroenterologist in our country uh, she had been head of uh, uh, kem gastroenterology department and now uh, so we welcome dr bhatia for uh, for your uh, kind consent to moderate this session uh, welcome dr saraswat and i request dr saraswat to uh, say a few words Uh, before we request uh, dr gosal to talk to us on very important topic and uh, not easy to understand esophageal manometry and impedance basic concepts and how do we use in our practice and what how do we interpret uh, these findings uh, with this dr saraswat please uh, thank you govind uh, good evening everyone on behalf of the indian society of gastroenterology it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this ongoing series of isd master classes for to which i am happy to say we have had a very gratifying response uh govind has told you about the background and how we plan to propose to continue with this meeting in uh, this fourth talk of the series uh, professor uday ghoshal whom you all know very well and is one of the leading names in the field of esophageal uh, of gi motility gi manometry in india and uh, globally will be speaking to you about esophageal manometry and impedance and i can promise you you are in for a treat because uday's lectures are always very lucid and uh, clear and his audience is uh, able to understand what is going on now the way the talk this evening will proceed is that uh, dr ghoshal will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so to complete the first part of his presentation when we'll break for about 5 minutes and questions that are sent in by all of you on the chat box which you can see at the bottom of your zoom screens will be screened and uh, professor shobhna bhatia dr makharia and myself will be handling this but uh, mainly dr bhatia will be attending to this then uday will complete his talk in the next 20 25 minutes and at the end of it we hope to have another 10 15 minutes during which we will address the questions being raised by the audience as we have done in the previous talks the questions that do, the unique questions that do not get answered during the live interaction will then be answered and posted by email as well as on the isg website 
as Govind has told you, we do plan to continue this uh, series of lectures. And uh, beyond 20th, we await your feedback, your suggestions and inputs. Not only how have these series gone, but what are the topics and areas that you would like to be covered by ISG master classes if in the ongoing series. And uh, with these few words, and I'll uh, request uh, Professor Uday Ghoshal now to deliver his talk to you on esophageal manometry and impedance. Uday, over to you, please. Uday, we are waiting for you. Please unmute yourself and get started with your talk. Yes. So thank you. Uh, greetings from Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow, and Indian Society of Gastroenterology. Thanks to Professor Gobin, Professor Sarasat, and Professor Bhatia. I'll be giving you a basic concept of esophageal manometry and impedance. But let me tell you, in such a short time, you cannot become master, but you get the concept. If you want to know more about it, you can refer to these two books. Both are from our uh, group. And I tell you, the left one gives you basic technique of performing the manometry and interpreting it. The right one gives everything, including theoretical aspects and the disease management. Now, when we talk about esophageal testing, you thought, it is all to do with structure. That means we do radiology, we do endoscopy, and we do histology, and we are done. So in endoscopy, you can talk about conventional endoscopy, advanced endoscopic te technique, esophageal capsule endoscopy, and US. I tell you, this is very little. There are a group of disorder which are related to abnormal physiology, and those abnormal physiological disorder give symptom but the structure may remain normal. So how do you assess this disorder? These are tested by esophageal manometry. Earlier we used to do conventional. Now we do high resolution manometry and impedance monitoring. Also some centers do high frequency endoluminal ultrasound, very research oriented, you need not know. We do pH metry for assessing acid in the esophagus which can be catheter based or Bravo capsule. Nowadays we do impedance pH battery and transit is assessed by radio nuclide esophageal MT. Now I'll focus primarily on esophageal management, but let me tell you, I'll give a little bit what everyone can do because I know in this country, maybe there are 200 odd manometry center but there are many more gastroenterologists in the country. So I'll give a little bit more than manometry. So what are the indication of esophageal manometry? Dysphagia without any mechanical obstruction. This we call as motor dysphagia. Non-cardiac chest pain, where there's a pain in the esophagus with or without dysphagia, but the cardiac workup is, is inconclusive. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, you will say, why should I do manometry in gastroesophageal reflux disease? When you do pH metry, you have to do a manometry because this is the best way to localize the LES and then place the esophageal manometry catheter about three to five centimeter above the upper margin of the LES. That is why you do. But also it gives you prognosis. For example, those patients with GRD who has very low esophageal alias pressure, those who have very poor esophageal motility actually have severe GRD. Systemic diseases with esophageal involvement, for example, myasthenia gravis, for example, progressive systemic sclerosis. And when you suspect you as dysfunction or upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction, still you do a esophageal body manometry to know that truly it is primarily an US dysfunction or there is something more in the esophageal body. Now, when you are actually encountering such a patient, you have to determine what patient are you dealing with. Are we dealing with a mechanical dysphagia or are you dealing with a motor dysphagia? And I tell you nowadays in the arena of investigative medicine, the clinical medicine is going away 
but I tell you, you means a lot if you forget intermittent. Because yes, typically intermittent, they have dysphagia both to solid and liquid from the very onset. You know why? Because liquid require better neuromuscular coordination to swallow than solid. Therefore, this patient may report problem with liquid in the, even from the very beginning. Warm temperature food are better tolerated by this patient. They can't really swallow the cold. They learn with time that if they raise their arm, they make their back erect. Actually, they can swallow better. You know why they are doing that? They are trying to compress the esophagus between the manubrium sterni and vertebra, increase the intraesophageal pressure, and trying to pop up the content through the LES, which is not relaxing. Duration is really long for motor. Episodic esophageal chest pain suggests suggest motor disorder. Regurgitation is very highly suggestive of motor dysphagia. In fact, these patients have dilated esophagus. That's why they regurgitate. And weight loss is minimal in motor, but more so in mechanic. Once you know you have a patient with motor dysphagia, you have taken history, you have done physical examination, then your choice of investigation start with upper GI endoscopy and or barium swallow. If you ask me, we do not subject this patient to endoscopy in the first go. You know why? Because most of the time they turn out to be achalasia and I know I have to dilate them. So therefore, why to give them trouble of doing endoscopy twice? Because endoscopy is not so comfortable. So what we do is either we do a barium Swallow, not really swallow, I'll tell you what we do. But most of our patients carry one of these investigations from outside and makes, this makes our life easy. If you find a stricture, you know this is mechanical, this is not motor. But if you find no stricture, you do an esophageal manometry. Occasionally, a barium swallow so something like this. On the left side, you can see dilated esophagus with multiple tertiary contractions. In the middle, you can see a hugely dilated esophagus, which is more than seven centimeter, we call mega esophagus. Mega esophagus and sigmoid esophagus means this is a decompensated esophageal disease. Don't consider that decompensation applies only to cirrhosis and not to esophageal disorder. And if this has happened, the patient usually have a poor prognosis. On the right side, you can see a classic corkscrew esophagus. But we do not do barium swallow for this patient. If you have been doing, please stop that. The better information you will obtain from time barium esophagogram. What is time barium esophagogram? You give 100 ml barium, 45% weight by volume. Then you do x-ray at one, two, and five minutes. See the height of the barium column at one, two, and five minutes. Also see the volume at different time. And what happens is the volume and the light products gives you the esophageal MG. So if somebody has a high volume, he has a greater height, this fellow has poor esophageal emptying because of body dysmotility and because of non-relaxation of alias. It's a very good investigation and correlate well with our manometry find. But let us come straight to manometry. What is manometry? In manometry, typically what we do is that we have x-axis. In the x-axis, it is time, it is time. That means you are recording the swallows in a patient on the x-axis at different time, typically at an interval of 15 to 30 seconds. On the y-axis, this is amplitude. So we get an amplitude of the contraction, we get a time, and that, therefore we can see that lower esophageal sphincter, like two channels on the bottom of this manometry dressing, they are relaxing. And you can see the body contraction. There is a progressively increasing amplitude. Also, there is a progressive delay as the contraction travels down. This is called peristalsis. Peristalsis is like a slope, so that when the upper part of the esophagus is contracting, the lower part is relaxing to receive the food bolus coming down. But what happened is this technology was an old technology, was being done about 25 years ago. Now we have changed now. And the change was brought by this gentleman. His name is Rai Klaus. Rai Klaus was a student of geography. 
Therefore, he used to see the mountain range in three dimensions. So he wanted the manometry because later he shifted to medicine and he wanted manometry to become three dimensional. So what he did is X axis remains the time. Y axis is the esophageal length. But if you tell me that if Y axis is esophageal length, X axis is the time, how do you represent the amplitude of contraction? This smart man, what he did is, he said, I'll give different colors to different degree of pressure. So I have made an analogy. I don't know whether this man thought about it or not. The analogy is with the nature. The nature, if you look at, sea is blue. As you go deeper to the sea, it is more deep blue. As you go to the paddy field, it is green. Go farther up, it is yellow. Sky is yellow when the setting sun is setting. Still up, the sky is red with the setting sun and the top of the sky is dark. So therefore, this is the color amplitude coding. The blue color represents the most negative pressure. Black color represents the most positive pressure and different shades of blue, green, yellow, orange, and red is higher and higher pressure. So therefore, this is called high resolution manometry. That's why these are called clouds plot. It goes by the name of right clouds. That here, esophageal length is represented in y-axis, time is represented in x-axis, and the color represents the amplitude of contrast. Now, let me give an example. This is one of our patients where you can see that above there's a blue. This is pharyngeal pressure. Below that, you can see there's a high pressure zone, red and green. This is actually upper esophageal sphincter pressure. Then you can see the lower, this is again blue. This is intrathoracic pressure. And then still below, you find there is a high pressure zone. This is lower esophageal sphincter. And still below, there is a negative pressure zone. This is gastric pressure. And you can see with each swallow, upper esophageal sphincter is open because pressure has become blue. And then there is a progressive contraction as it travels down, the pressure is higher and higher. And there is a clear cut slope. That means the lower part is contracting much later than the upper part of the esophageal body. Now, therefore, you will ask me, what is the difference between this conventional and high resolution manometry? One is the way it is displayed is different. It is displayed with color, it looks very attractive. People did not like those uh, EGG or EMG or ECG type graph, but they like now because this is a color plot, this is a 3D plot. But more than that is actually number of port. Earlier when I used to do manometry when I was a DM student, we used to have six or eight ports. So six or eight port means two port will be in the lower esophageal sphincter, one port to the stomach, and four or five port will be in the body. So esophageal body is so long, see like 30 or 40 centimeter. And there, if you give one port every, uh, if you give four or five port, you have one port every, every six centimeter. So if you have one port in every six centimeter, if this is the contraction, the contraction of circular muscle is the one which is recorded. You know why? Because circular muscle impedes the flow of water through the port in which water is flowing, that is manometry port. So if there is a circular muscle contraction as shown in the left slide, which is squeezing the catheter between the port, this contraction will not be recorded. On the other, on the right side, I have shown a high resolution manometry where varying between 32 to 64 port catheter are there. So if it is 32 port, almost every one or two centimeter, you have a port, so there is a lesser chance that this contraction will be missed. And therefore, it records more number of contraction. Also, the conventional manometry often used to be water perfusion system, whereas high resolution manometry is often solid state system and solid state does not lead to delay in the recording of the contraction that happens in the esophagus into the computer which is located outside. Since this is a little complicated, I'll skip this. I'll bring you to the concept of impedance because when we are talking about manometry, Gobind asked me to talk not only on manometry, 
but manometry impedance. So what is impedance? Impedance means electrical resistance, electrical resistance. So if, let us say, I have a catheter, which has pore, impedance pore, and is lying in the esophagus. So obviously, esophageal lumen has a baseline impedance. So let us say this is the baseline impedance. Now, the fellow swallows, and this is a liquid bolus. When the liquid bolus travels through the impedance port and touches the two impedance port, what will happen is we all know the electrical resistance get reduced in the fluid media than in the gas media. So therefore, the resistance will reduce as the bolus enters and touches the two impedance port. Now, when the bolus is passing through the two impedance port, again, the resistance will remain low. And then subsequently, when the bolus escapes these two pores, again, the impedance will go up. So typically what will happen is if I swallow a liquid bolus, and if I'm doing a manometry along with impedance, what will happen is impedance will give that bolus has, bolus has crossed. And the manometry will give me the pressure. So the pressure is the activity of the muscle that the manometry will give me and the bolus passage will be given by impedance. Remember one more thing here, like liquid bolus reduces the impedance, gaseous bolus increases the impedance. So therefore somebody belches, you can see that because belching is associated with the passage of gas. Similarly, somebody swallows air because of aerophagy, you can see that because the impedance will go up. Now, let us take this simple example. Here you can see this is a esophagus, in the esophagus, you can see there are multiple manometry port, the round ones, and also there are multiple impedance port, the boxes, the dark boxes. Let us say the fellow swallows a liquid. What will happen is liquid bolus will pass, and as it passes, you can see the white lines there on the right side is actually the contraction of the circular muscles, which is recorded by manometry system and the red lines there is the impedance recording which shows the bolus has crossed. So therefore, let us compare with cardiologists. The cardiologist uses echocardiography to see the flow of blood and they use ECG to record the muscular contraction because electrical event lead to muscular or mechanical event. So let us compare this mechanical event somewhat like ECG activity that is manometry and the bolus passage is like echocardiography, that is passage of the blood. So let us come to types of peristalsis. Peristalsis can be primary, can be secondary, can be tertiary. What is primary peristalsis? Primary peristalsis is a swallow-associated peristalsis. Primary peristalsis is a swallow-associated peristalsis. How will you show that whether it is swallow-associated or not? If you see that US pressure has become low and then there is a passage or there is a peristaltic event, this is primary peristalsis. On the other hand, if you find the US pressure did not become low, that means US did not open, still there is a peristalsis, this is a secondary peristalsis. Therefore, left side of this signal, you can, or tracing, you can see a primary peristalsis where US has opened and the right side, you can see a secondary peristalsis where US not, did not open. So this is not one of the best spontaneous example. I induced it, but for the simplification. And what is tertiary peristalsis? Tertiary peristalsis is like atrial fibrillation where there is any mechanical activity hard, hardly at all. And you can see here the impedance. The impedance is recorded by again color. Purple color means fluid, whereas white means that the impedance port is touching the mucosa. So white means impedance port is touching the mucosa. Now purple means it is liquid and blue means there is air. And you can see here, the fellow has swallowed. When he swallowed, you can beautifully see that you, uh, esophageal contraction has happened. Elias has relaxed and fluid has gone to the stomach. But can you see a long break in the middle of the esophagus? This is called peristaltic break. And because of that peristaltic break, there is a bolus escape. What is bolus escape? That means all of the fluid has not gone to the stomach, 
only some has got the stomach and the remaining is the rem uh, retained in the esophagus and this we call as a bolus escape. You will tell me all this theoretical thing you are speaking. Let me come to a real life example because I know most of you are practicing clinician. You like to learn from example. This is a 19 year old son of a doctor and he is himself is a third year medical student. You'll say, why are you telling that? I'm trying to tell you, this is what is happening to a doctor who understands why. He had dysphagia, regurgitation, and occasional heartburn, but no chest pain for one year. He also, oh, dysphagia, regurgitation, must be a calicia type. Possible. Upper GI endoscopy is normal. And high resolution manometry done elsewhere was diagnostic of type 1 achalasia, and he was planned for a OEM. OEM is endoscopic, muco you see, uh, parural esophageal myotomy. Parural endoscopic esophageal myotomy. So one will take the endoscope down, then will cut the sort of esophageal mucosa, tunnel through the submucosa, then cut the LES mass. Now he was planned for that. Now he got a barium swallow done. It shows somewhat dilated esophagus, but not typical parodic, no problem. It happens sometimes. Now still, because the poem is very destructive procedure, this doctor thought he is himself a surgeon. He said, let me go for a second opinion. And we did a manometry. And what we found is, yes, he has a beautiful US. The US is relaxing with each swallow. Now, yes, there is hardly any contraction. The contraction looks quite simultaneous. The LES looks like relaxing a little bit. Can you see there? LES is relaxing a little bit. But still, superficially, if you look at it, you may say, oh, this looks like a calicia type 1. But look at the impedance above. The impedance shows that fluid is practically going down to the stomach. There is hardly any bolus escape. So this raised a suspicion to us because we found his LES is relaxing and there is a beautiful flow of fluid down. So in our system, we can overlay impedance on the pressure. So we overlaid the impedance on the pressure and you can see each time there is a contraction of the esophageal muscle, though it is looking like simultaneous, there is a fluid passing into the stomach. So hardly there is much bolus escape except a little bit above there. So we wanted to make a 3D. I don't know whether 3D can be shown in this video conferencing. Just let me know it is showing. What you can see in the 3D, when he's swallowing the bolus, US is opening, bolus is going down, entering into the stomach, and then refluxing back. You want me to replay once more? OK. So, OK, I can't replay this. No problem. No problem. So I'll replay from here. OK. Now look at this. What is happening is when he's swallowing, US is opening, bolus is coming down the esophagus, entering fully into the stomach and then refluxing back. So it is, is it reflux esophagus? So what happens is we did a 24 hour pH metry and it was a patient with severe gastroesophageal reflux. So you can understand what would have happened if you would have undergone a poem. So why manometry appeared like this? Manometry appeared like this because he doesn't have any esophageal muscle, hardly any esophageal muscle. It is like severe scleroderma type esophagus. This may be myopathy, this may be neuropathy, more likely to be myopathy of the esophagus. So what was happening is each time he was swallowing, the catheter gets pulled up a little bit and that pulling up of the catheter creates some flicker-like activity which looks simultaneous. So this sort of error can happen, and that tells you that the sophistication in the system is required before you do a lot of invasive procedures. So may let me come to achalasia then, because I refer to you type 1 achalasia. Now let me tell you what is type 2 achalasia and what is type 3 achalasia. Type 1 achalasia means no esophageal pressurization like our patient had, hardly any esophageal muscle activity. In fact, the example that I displayed here is not the right example. The example would be, there will be one US activity above, one will be LES activity below, there is nothing in between. Type two means panesophageal pressurization. That means the muscle is still there, but it is misbehaving. It is contracting simultaneously. 
This is throughout the esophageal vein. And type three is segmental esophageal pressurization, which means muscle is there. It is misbehaving, but misbehaving only in one segment. And let me tell you, pathophysiologically, type three is the early disease. Type two is little later disease. Type one is the worst disease or most late disease. That means most of the type one may be having esophageal decompensation. And I tell you, Nitesh Pratap from India showed the type two respond best to pneumatic dilation. You know why? Because the muscle is still intact. So therefore you disrupt the LES, the fellow will swallow better. It is like if somebody has aortic stenosis and now the ventricular muscle is still intact, you do aortic bulbotomy, you will get a better relief than if somebody has ventricular muscle has become flabby and now he has left ventricular failure, you do aortic bulbotomy, it will not work so well. So let me come to this example, just to show you what achalasia means, and we stop here and take question because I've already taken 25 minutes. So, Dr. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of questions already, and uh, I'll just uh, take a few. Uh, Uday, what you uh, started off with uh, a fantastic thing about the technique, but a lot of questions that have come are related to uh, the procedure itself. Like, do you use water swallows or semi-solid swallows? Do you use uh, uh, rapid drinking challenges or multiple rap rapid swallows? Do you think you want to discuss it now or you yeah, can yeah, send yeah, these uh, answers? I'll discuss, I'll discuss uh, briefly. I'll discuss briefly. Yes, please. Because Robin told me specifically make it general concept. Yes. But still the question has come. I tell you, that if you are using a water percussion manometric system, we use water swallow. But if you are using a solid state system with impedance, we use saline swallow because yes. saline lowers the impedance more. As per recommendation, just don't stop by 10 water swallow or 10 saline swallows. You have to do a multiple rapid drink challenge and you have to do a viscous swallow. Typically, when we bought our manometry machine, apple sauce came with it but I think apple sauce is too costly. We use simple card from our yes. canteen to give this. Correct. Customers. Okay, what about rapid drinking challenge and multiple rapid swallows? Do you use that? You see, we use multiple rapid swallow. So because you see many a time, if a fellow has mild disorder, if you give the esophagus rest and ask him to swallow, actually you may get normal. Whereas when you challenge the esophagus, with multiple swallows in one go, esophagus may so abnormality. So as a part of the routine, you are supposed to do multiple rapid swallows. Okay. Now, uh, the most of the other questions are related to the types of machines that are available. Is there a difference between 16 and 36 channels? I think you already explained that, that when you have 36 you channels, see, you get a better number, definition. Yeah, as you increase the number of four, your definition will be better. We yes. manometry people call it fidelity. What is fidelity? Fidelity means reliability. So we are more reliable. But I tell you that for practice, there is reliability, doesn't matter. Achalasia will be sold as achalasia, whether you so use a water perfusion system or solid state system. But if you are into research and you want a lot of matrices to report as the research data, we want multiple port and solid state, but for practice, solid state is not doable because each catheter costs 15 lakh Indian rupees and one catheter will give you 400 manometry. Though in our lab, we have done 1200 manometries with one catheter, luckily, but still it yes. was very expensive. Now Correct. about second question you asked is, uh, what was that? What is any difference between so many companies that are making yeah, yeah. these no, machines? Whatever machine you are using, you become familiar. We have three mass, four machines in our lab. One, we have Hibbert system, which is a water perfusion system. Recently, we received a donation LESAR system for research. Now, we have a Sandil system, which is solid state, and pediatric gastroenterology people have MMS system. I've used all these systems, and all are good. Yeah. So, what is the difference between using 5 ml and 10 ml swallows? You see, as you give a higher volume swallow, what will happen is your vigor of contraction is going to be better. You know why? You remember Starling law, which was taught to us in cardiology in first year and second year. 
Starling law says that when is, you stretch a muscle, it contracts more vigorously. So if you retain a muscle swallow, the muscle will contract more. Typically, in our place, we give standard 5 ml swallow. If you want 10 ml swallow, you use 10 ml swallow, but consistently. You can't just give your cases 5 ml swallow, control 10 ml swallow, and produce data which looks significant. So you have to use consistent volume. We use 5 ml swallow. Okay, so Uday, there are many more questions on how to analyze the manometry tracing, but I think part of it will come when you come to the rest of the presentation. So I will stop the questions now and we go to the, uh, we continue with the presentation. Thank you so much. Can I ask you one more thing? Yes. yes. Uh, can you use your pointer uh, while you, uh, while you uh, talk about tracings? So we can no, go along with you on the street. Tell me, will the pointer be shown? Yeah, yeah. If you put your, your desktop condition. Oh, the cursor on the of the, the okay. cursor. Okay, okay, okay. No problem. I'll see you. Now let us go to the next. Somebody would say, I remember one of our uh, teacher used to say in the early days when you were doing PM, what is the value of doing manometry in patients? Because there is no value. I can say from the symptom and a barium swallow this is the calcia and I die. I tell you it's not right. Because banometry is the gold standard for the diagnosis of achalasia, and today in the days of litigation, if you have dilated somebody with a presumptive diagnosis of achalasia incorporated and it goes to the court, nobody can save you. No expert will recommend dilatation or anything without manometry. It is the best case to differentiate from other motility disorder, for example, diffuse esophageal spot. It helps you to subtype achalasia, and I tell you, if you get type 3 achalasia, then you have to straight give him something else because most of the patient pneumatic dilation fail in type 3 achalasia. Sometime when barium and endoscopy doesn't show any change, manometry will give you diagnosis. Even we know some cases where nothing works, if you challenge the early achalasia with polycystokinin, you can give the diagnosis before even manometry shows that no. Post pneumatic dilation, LES pressure suggests adequacy of pneumatic dilation. So, therefore, you know you have done a good job. Otherwise, the fellow will recur and all those painful things will happen. When you treat a patient of achalasia, and if he's type 2 achalasia or type 3 achalasia, and in addition to dysphagia, he has pain, tell the patient that my dilation is going to help your dysphagia, may not help the pain. Pain may burn out with time. Also, variant echolasia and diffuse esophageal spasm may require different approach. For example, if there is a variant echolasia with a long spastic zone, you may require an extended helar myotomy or extended uh, poem. So therefore, manometry is very, very important. Now, what is value of manometry in GRD? Severe GRD is more often associated with the reduced amplitude of contraction in the lower esophagus and LES pressure below six millimeter mercury. And I tell you this is important. Like the first patient that I showed you had a very low LES pressure and had hardly any contraction in the lower body. Now this patient should ideally don't go for fundoplication because post fundoplication is going to have dysphagia. If at all you venture to do a fundoplication, make a loose ramp. Though randomized control trial, don't substantiate this, but everything cannot be answered by randomized control. This patient has also to be told in the beginning that you will require a high dose lifelong PPI. And many of these patients we treat in addition to PPI and prokinetic with pyridostigmine because pyridostigmine improve esophageal motility. Such patients, I told you, there are, these are ideal candidates for surgical treatment if the body motility is reasonable, okay? Now I'll skip this slide because this talks about pathogenesis of achalasia, the relationship between cholinergic activity and nitrinergic activity. But I know this will take a little long. If you want, you can go to this paper of ours published in World Journal of Gastroenterology in 2012 and it is a free full text article. Now when you do esophageal manometry, this is the machine we are looking for. This machine that I have shown here is a solid state machine but obviously there isn't water perfusion machine in that. Now, typically lower esophageal sphincter normal value is 20 to 35 millimeter of mercury. 
earlier in the conventional system, we knew the upper limit is 40 millimeter of mercury. Now in the high resolution system, this is 35 millimeter of mercury. Now, lower value is 20, but remember one thing, that even somebody is 18, 15, it is good enough. When below 10, we say abnormally low. Below six, really bad. So therefore, the lower value, there is a bottom line zone. Now there is a trun in the middle of the esophagus and this transition zone reflect that this area has both smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Now this area should be less than two centimeters. If it is more than two centimeters, it is abnormal. It is abnormal. And this may lead to dysphagia. Now what is the mechanism of swallow? The moment somebody swallows, the bolus goes inside the esophagus. This bolus leads to a pressure, and this is called intravolar pressure. Can you see here? When the US has opened, the intrathoracic pressure has become higher, and this is because of intravolar pressure. Now, the moment bolus is entered, the circular muscle of the esophagus proximal to the bolus contract, both longitudinal contracts and circular contract. But typically, the manometry is recording primarily the circular muscle activity. So the circular muscle of the esophagus contract. And this circular muscle contraction gives rise to what is called esophageal contractile form. Esophageal contractile form. Now what happens is, the moment this happens, remember one thing, when US happens, through the vagus nerve reflex the LES opens. So US opens through the vagus nerve reflexly the LES opens. So US opening is associated with the LES opening. There is no delay. Now, this is here, LES has opened. Now, when the LES opened, there is a residual pressure in the LES. This is called integrated relaxation pressure. The integrated relaxation pressure is, it is a lowest average pressure. Over a four second window, which need not be continuous after the swallowing. After the swallowing means after the US opening. So it is a average minimum pressure. It is the average minimum pressure over a four second window, which need not be continuous. That's why you see there are white boxes. It has sampled the lowest pressure. And then this is integrated relaxation pressure. If integrated relaxation pressure is reasonably much below the esophageal contractile form, then the bolus. So when does dysphagia occur? If esophageal contractile front is very weak, for example, much weaker than IRP or integrated relaxation pressure, then dysphagia occur. If IRP is high, then dysphagia occur. So the combination of these two, it is the esophageal contractile front pressure and the IRP, the combination of these two explain dysphagia or disbalance between the two explain dysphagia. What is the concept of DCI or distal contractile integral? Earlier, we used to represent the contraction amplitude by, by. Earlier, we used to represent the contraction amplitude by average amplitude. Now we do not represent it or express it by average amplitude. We express it by distal contractile integral or DCI. You also where from this DCI came? I tell you, DCI was there very much. DCI was there in the small bowel manometry. In the small bowel manometry, this was not called DCI, but it was called motility index. What is motility index? Motility index is amplitude of contraction into duration of contraction into number of contraction. Because in small bowel, there are repeated contraction. Like once migratory motor complex comes in the duodenum and jejunum, you will get 12 contraction in a minute. So all these 12 contraction gives to area under the pressure. So therefore, in the small bowel to express the contractile vigor, people designed long ago, decades ago, motility index. What is motility index? It is amplitude of contraction into duration of contraction into number of contraction. Because in the esophagus, you are dealing with only one contraction. Therefore, the number of contraction is not there. It is amplitude into duration. So DCI means it is the amplitude of contraction into duration of contraction. 
what is contractile front velocity contractile front velocity means if there is a contraction activity here let us say here in the middle of the esophagus and there is a deceleration point here in the lower part of the esophagus below ileus obviously we know the time from the x axis how much time did it take now if the time taken i know for this many centimeter i can calculate what is the velocity so per second how many centimeter is it travel if the velocity is more than 8 cm per second it is bad it means in simultaneous contraction so if you are too fast if you have esophagus which is too fast you have a bad esophagus it causes simultaneous contraction it should be lower than 8 cm per second that should be the velocity now these are the normal value that i already told you but briefly i am telling you that esophagogastric junction pressure should be between 20 to 35 ml of mercury lower limit is 10 and when it relaxes the irp should be below 15 ml of mercury when it relaxes the irp should be below 15 ml of mercury here it is written nadir pressure nadir pressure we do not use anymore we use irp nadir pressure was the lowest value in one location irp is an average of over 4 second which need not be continued now remember one thing if somebody has a very over low amplitude contraction earlier we used to call low amplitude contraction when it was below 30 mm of mercury was the amplitude but now we tell it when your dci is very low for example less than 100 uh, mm of mercury per centimeter per second and remember one thing what is a very strong contraction earlier in the chicago classification earlier works and we said anything above 5000 mm of mercury per centimeter per second should be considered as abnormal now this has been changed now we say more than 8000 more than 8000 more than 5000 is abnormal but you don't consider that as a gross disease but if it is more than 8000 then you say uh, jack hammer is okay jack hammer is okay. so this is what you do when you interpret manometry typically look at irp first when you look at irp if irp is abnormal then means look at the peristalsis if irp is abnormal but the peristalsis is normal that means this is ejg outflow obstruction ejg outflow obstruction earlier we used to call that as hypertensive ileus maybe early stage of ileus also but if irp is abnormal more than 15 mm of mercury look at the body motility if body motility shows pan esophageal pressurization is in more than 20% of the swallow that means stem swallow more than 2 then this is type 2 ileus if it is a segment is showing pan esophageal pressurization in more than two contraction this is type 3 ecclesia on the other hand if there is hardly any peristalsis hardly any amplitude hardly any amplitude then this is type 1 ecclesia okay there are several other uh, variation which i'll not go to detail maybe you can take in the question and succession like i told you jack hammer esophagus which is more than 8000 mm of mercury per centimeters per second i told you peristaltic break like long transition zone more than 2 cm and so on these are some of the example here this is a normal manometry this one shows that there is a hiatus hernia can you see there is a high pressure zone above high pressure zone below there is a high pressure zone above there is a high pressure zone below and there is in between a low pressure zone this is hiatus hernia and there are studies to show there are studies to show that manometry is superior to endoscopy in diagnosis of hiatus hernia you can see here the same patient has hiatus hernia in addition there is a long peristaltic break so therefore this patient is like the earlier patient that i presented is likely to have seen here gr rather this one is more classic like our pressure that i presented hardly any activity in the body there is a very low ileus pressure some us activity can be seen 
This one I am trying to show a patient where you can see there is a simultaneous contraction. There is another contraction which looks like peristaltic. This may be diffuse esophageal trauma. So when all contractions are simultaneous, it is a calcium. When 20% or more contractions are peristaltic, but the others are simultaneous, this is diff diffuse esophageal spasm or distal esophageal spasm. This is tied to a calcium. Okay. And this is, uh, uh, this one again tied to a calcium. Remember one thing, when somebody has hugely dilated esophagus, you may get intrathoracic pressure is also high because esophagus contributes to intrathoracic pressure. So therefore, between the contraction, if you look at, you find the pre intrathoracic pressure is rather high, not typically blue like as you are seeing in every patient, but it, look like, it looks like yellow. This means this is a high intrathoracic pressure, possibly because dilated esophagus filled with fluid and food. Now, this one is interesting. This one obviously is a very high amplitude contraction. If these are simultaneous, you will see, say, it is panesophageal pressurization. But if these are not simultaneous, you will say this is jackhammer esophagus, particularly if it is a rich state. But this is not for what I am showing this one. What I am showing here is look at this LES. Each time the contraction is happening, alias is getting lifted up. So therefore, if you try to measure the relaxation here, it will look like alias is beautifully relaxed. This is called pseudo relaxation. This lifting up of the esophageal alias is happening because of the longitudinal muscle. Like in a patient in whom circular muscle is hyperactive, longitudinal muscle will also be hyperactive. Now this longitudinal muscle is lifting up the alias so therefore, if you do not know, you will put your cursor over here and then you may see that the alias is relaxing and you can make an error, say this is not a calcium. And I have such patient coming from big, big centers, I will not name obviously, where they wanted me to see the dressing for a second look and I saw this was reported as not a calcium because the alias is relaxing. But the placement of the uh, sort of measurement area was wrong. Now, clinical utility of assessing alias pressure and emptying after manometry. See, sorry, Dr. Sarasat is sitting here. Don't mind. When we treat hepatology patient, we split hairs, which is good, which led to good outcome of those patients. When we treat luminal patient, we lump them too much. We say you can do the way you like. That creates disservice to them. So suppose if you have done dilatation in a patient, what happens is if somebody was suffering so long, you gave a little bit of relief, he becomes euphoric and he over-report symptomatic relief. You have to show objectively that you have done a good job. And this is a study to show that where they treated achalasia patient, subsequently they did a time barium esophagogram to see whether they have done a good job or not. Those patients in whom time barium esophagogram showed that they did a good job and the symptoms was relieved were called concordant group. Those patients in whom time barium esophagogram showed that you did not do a good job, but symptoms was relieved, they were called discordant patient. Look at the recurrence. Somewhere around 10% versus 77%. Can you imagine? And this is over seven, uh, seven years follow-up, yes. Now, but this recurrent separation started in one year. Look at this, or even less than one. So the separation started very early. So therefore, recurrence will be more if you did not do a good job. We wanted to compare if I am a manometry guy and I don't have a facility, let us say, of time barium exophagogram. Let us say my radiologist is not cooperating. Can I tell the same by manometry? And I found that yes, time barium esophagogram do as good, does as good job as manometry. Sorry, this is written under review. This is published long ago. Sorry for the mistake. So therefore, this is my end slide. So I tell you, all these interpretation technique, truly speaking, if you want to learn, we have to have a workshop of six hour, eight hour or 10 hour. This cannot be taught in a half an hour. But I gave you some concept. It is like, it is a cotton razor. And I told you that if you want to learn more, 
go to these two books. Very comprehensive, not because I have been involved with it. I think the right one is the best book in the manometry which has come till date in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Uday. I think, uh, yes, I can see you clapping, Shobhna, but unfortunately, we do not have a system for applause and uh, uh, the speaker the realizing how how his audience is appreciating his presentation. As usual, a masterly presentation. Uday is a master of his subject and he's also very clear and lucid in his explanations. And Uday, I'm happy to say that almost 100 questions have poured in, in during the time you were speaking to us. So I'll uh, start uh, with a few of them and then I think uh, Govind and Shobhna can uh, step in with a few more. One of the things that seems to be bothering at least uh, four people from uh, different places is, what do you do? What do you do when you have uh, in a dilated esophagus? This is Abhinav from Delhi, Vishal from Ahmedabad, Sudhir again from Delhi, Sanjeev Kar from Katak, sigmoid esophagus, tight, LES, the catheter will not cross. How will you get across to do a manometry? What is your practice? I tell you that if you are using a solid, it's water perfusion system. When you are using a water perfusion system, you tie a thread in the tip of the cavity and then take that using an endoscope. But when you report, you must report that the catheter was passed using an endoscope because your LES pressure is going to be fallaciously low. Second is if you are many a time, what we have done is water perfusion is not working. We took the patient to solid state system. And in solid state, it worked because the solid state catheter is more rigid. Yes. That is the second way. Third way is that ask the patient to see it. If you have a habit of doing lying down manometry, just ask the patient to see it. And while the patient is sitting, you give water to him so that he keeps on drinking a little bit, not too much, so that when he is swallowing, simultaneously you push a little bit, push a little bit, yeah, push a little bit. Right. But I tell you, after all this, in two or four, three percent, you may fail. All your attempt may fail. Then what we do is that we do a body manometry and we write the alias could not be crossed. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rangarajan from Bangalore and uh, uh, Dr. Ankit Patel, they want to know something about characterizing a hiatus hernia on HRM, particularly how do you identify the pressure inversion or the respiratory inversion point? And uh, what exactly is the utility of HRM in a hiatus hernia patient? I tell you, they have classified this hiatus hernia into type 1, type 2, type 3, type all those. I don't think there is any, any clinical utility in my opinion. I'll tell you why. Like you say, type 1 echolysia, type 2 echolysia, type 3 echolysia. You know the outcome is different. So there is a clinical value. Similarly, you know, when you uh, get uh, something like in, uh, in also fecal evacuation disorder, people have uh, said, Sarkis Rao has said, type 1, type 2, type 3. There is no value. You know why? Because you have not shown any clinical utility. Still, you, when you have asked, I will answer. Typically, what you look at is, is there a separation at all? So if there is a separation, there may not be any separation. That means separation between what? Diaphragmatic pinch cock and the smooth muscle radius. Is there a separation? No separation. Okay, very good. It is the most healthy LES one can talk about. The second is, is there a separation? If there is, is it less than two centimeter or more than two centimeter? If it is less than two centimeter, tell people, so, oh, it looks like little unhealthy LES, but not too bad, not too bad. Now then, if this is more than two centimeter, you look at the respiratory inversion point. I'll give you what is the concept of respiratory inversion point. Let us say if I have a manometric catheter and the ports are in the stomach and the fellow take inspiration, what will happen to the pressure? the pressure will go up because intragastric pressure rises on inspiration. Why does it rise on inspiration? This is because that the intragast, your diaphragm is coming down. So therefore, intra-abdominal pressure is rising. So intragastric pressure will rise. Now suppose if I'm pulling that catheter up and it has come to LES, what will happen in inspiration, LES pressure, it will rise. Why will it, why will it, why, why will it rise? Why should LES pressure rise when I take inspiration? This rises because the moment intragastric pressure rose, 
there would be an attempt for reflux and nature has made a mechanism that reflux would not happen so therefore ileus pressure will rise so stomach pressure will rise on inspiration the ileus pressure will rise on inspiration but the moment your port has reached the thorax during inspiration the intrathoracic pressure will fall so that is inversion really so that is the inversion point where reverse has happened and look at whether the inversion point is below or above that becomes type 3 am but i to tell you this doesn't have gilded any clinical issue but i know most of the automated software will want you to tell what type of ileus are is right okay that was quite a detailed explanation i'll just have one or two quick questions and i'll ask the others to take over uh, uh regarding achalasias type 1 2 and 3 a question from dr sagar and also samir patel sagar is from delhi samir patel is from chennai is uh, is this a progression as you said type 3 is the earlier stage type 2 is later and type 1 is the most burnt out advanced stage so in every patient do you expect a continuum and a progression from type 3 to type 1 or are they separate diseases and uh, similarly i think sameer's question is that if type 3 is earlier why does it not respond well to pneumatic dilatation yeah very good question you see what happens is i'll tell you why achalasia occurs esophageal muscle typically is syncytium so what is syncytium syncytium means all the muscle fiber is interconnected with gap junctions so that means the most moment one esophageal muscle is depolarized whole of the esophagus has to get depolarized whole of the esophagus so that means normal behavior of the esophagus is simultaneous contraction it is like normal behavior of people is to go out and do loitering outside but because of the lockdown enforcement of law we can't go out. so then what is we, what is enforcing the law here it is nitric oxide so what nature has done is that normally cholinergic system causes contraction and that is responsible for simultaneous contraction but nature has given a nitrinergic system and the nitrinergic system is higher in quantity in the lower esophagus therefore you have a simultaneous contraction when there is a degeneration of the nitrinergic system what happens is you get achalasia first is type 3 because there is a segmental loss of the nitrinergic system then you get type 2 because it is a more diffuse loss of nitrinergic system so the gradient between the upper and the lower esophagus is lost now what do you get later you get valerian degeneration of the cholinergic system because you know in neurology any nerve goes off in the periphery there is a backward valerian degeneration that's why people have shown the levy body which occurs in parkinson syndrome in brain stem of achalasia patient now what happens is now cholinergic system goes off and therefore it becomes type 1 now when people classified maybe because of the commonness of type 1 and type 2 they classified rather than looking at the pathophysiology pathophy and later they realize the pathophysiology if you want me to tell does it evolve like this yes there are case report there are small series in which people have shown even distal esophageal spasm and diffuse esophageal spasm past then type 1 type 2 achalasia and so on even there are case report of hypertensive ileus going to type 1 type 2 and type 3 and so on obviously type 3 pass then type 2 and then type 1 now whether it happens in all patient we don't know. we don't know because all this literature comes as case report and small case series whether it happens in everybody is not possible possible because you can't study natural history of a disease for the fun of studying and reporting the data why doesn't type 3 respond well to pneumatic dilatation could you take that yeah that's right that is a difficult question but i tell you what are you doing in pneumatic dilatation if you look at like i remember one patient i saw this was a patient of achalasia he had a very long non relaxing jaw now what are you doing in pneumatic dilatation you were using a 5 cm or 6 cm balloon and only dilating one part but your long jaw is around 8 cm therefore it is not respond if we had a balloon to do a very long length dilatation maybe it will work that's why people have shown that if you inject botox over a long length it works oem long length it works heller's myotomy long length work because it is a long length disease that's why it is not work i think uh, govind you could take over if there is anything muted govind you are govind you are muted you are muted 
okay yes. so i have uh, uh, out of all the 100 cases i have taken up three or four answers. that are relevant uday, 120 uday, now uday only short answers because uh, time is limited uday, yes only short answers yes. okay so uh, there are uh, one or two very important questions that have been asked one is what is the position of the patient is it standard or do you uh, or can you change the position and will the values change People have shown that different position changes the values and therefore use a standard position for yourself. You are supposed to do validation of the normal value for your lab or otherwise you follow the position what others have done. Like I know Srinivas has done normal value study published in neurogastroenterology motility. Yes. So you have the same position. Okay. And what about uh, a patient who has a first few swallows showing type 1 ecclesia and then the rest of the swallows are showing pressurization would you classify their type 1 or type 2 you this is a difficult problem i will see ultimately that chicago is quite silent about it yes. but i think you pathophysiologically you see as you put more volume of the into the esophagus the contraction is going to increase so if you want to know the natural situation of the patient use the earlier values not the later values in the later values you have stretched the muscle and you are getting a bigger contraction Correct. Now, the uh, other important thing, and this is very important, not only for manometry, but for many other automated systems. Uh, let's say the system provides you with a diagnosis at the end of the analysis. How reliable is this diagnosis? Or should you be physically analyzing each swallow as you go along? You see, do not rely on automated analysis. I showed you one example, glaring. Yes, Obviously, correct. some people, what they do is that they don't look at the signal very well, clicks on automatic analysis, and whatever they get, then there is no need for doctor. Typically, each swallow you see visually, if there is a discordancy again, thin, and you, 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 you can't do, just go by automatic. I say, I don't like automatic. Correct. I agree. And I think it's also important to go by the clinical picture of the patient and not just go only by the manometry. Uh, last question, I think that's relevant for all of us, not only for manometry. Uh, what is the scenario for manometry in the COVID era? Should you be doing manometry in the COVID era? Yes. <laughs> Very good. I tell you, we have made a guideline. The okay. guideline is going to guard. This is Asian Neurogastronomy Motility Association. I don't know whether it will be accepted, but it will uh, if it is going. No, manometry is a high risk procedure. Esophageal yes. manometry is a very high risk procedure. It is too much aerosol generated. Between esophageal manometry and the anorectal manometry, anorectal manometry has been rated as marginally safer, but let me tell you, 50% of COVID patients excrete the virus in the feces. Yes. 12 cell yes. nanopartial cell. Correct. True. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful talk. And let me ask you one uh, other question, uh, which is very interesting, that how do you treat ineffective esophageal peristalsis? You you asked a good question, I tell you. Many of these patients have associated dysphagia and reports. So I'll give a PPI. I'll give a prokinetic. And I use propylidostigmine alone. When I get a patient like this, I use pyridosine. Now, procalopride actually works or increases the activity of pyridosine, procalopride. So in the prokinetic, I like procalopride there. I use pyridosine. And even we have shown that on pyridosine, not only symptom improves, even the motility pattern improves. So we are planning to do a randomized control trial. But fact, there is data. I know seven studies are there not in relation to esophagus, whole gut. There are seven yes. studies, and we have just communicated our data of 60 patients, where in seven we use pyridostigmine, and it worked. And even Sagar from Nagpur says that uh, his question was, can you use pyridostigmine? Pyridostigmine for the yes. yes. In fact, you say that we can use yeah, it. Right. And what could be the dose, uh, and uh, how long do you use? See, typically, I am, not a, I am not a neurologist, so I am very cautious. I typically will start maybe in a low dose, 30 milligram BD and gradually increase. And how long do you use? How long will you use? That is a very important problem. If somebody has a defect from the beginning, he has a defect. Now, therefore, you have to use as long as they need. Okay. There are many more questions. I don't think we'll be able to take many more questions in interest of time. 
So Dr. Ghosal will send all these questions to you for your attention. And if you can read these questions and uh, if you can answer some of these questions, uh, we'll be very thankful to you. And then these answers can be sent to uh, every person who's participated today and uh, for their uh, knowledge base. So thank you, Dr. Uday, for a wonderful masterly talk. And as Dr. Sarso said, that we applaud your efforts, your expertise in this area. We all of us know that you are the star uh, in this field in our country. And, and we all look forward to your presentations. Everybody enjoy your presentation whenever you speak. So thank you again for uh, kindly consenting to this uh, webinar. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatia, for again, as, thank you. Uh, uh, as uh, graceful as always, and, and <laughs> thank you. bringing uh, value to this, uh, these webinars. And Dr. Saraswat, thank you so very much uh, uh, for again yes. supporting me every time. So uh, with this we end, but before <laughs> we end, we will have a next webinar on this Sunday, that is uh, May, May of 3rd, when we have a very important topic, uh, that is uh, uh, how do you treat, diagnose and treat uh, hepatitis B virus in 2020? And for that, we have a speaker, none other than Dr. Sib Kumar Sarin. And I think uh, he's a world leader in this field. And it will be, uh, he's all our, this will be our, our uh, advantage that we listen to him uh, on this Sunday, 12 to 1 on May 3rd. Uh, okay, thank you all. It's been a very, very, um, uh, I think, educative experience for not just the rest of you in the audience, but for some of us on the panel also. Uday's talk has been uh, an, an experience. 130 questions coming your way, Uday. Some very thoughtful, <laughs> inter uh, thoughtful questions. See, you took so much time answering each of the questions live. So you'll probably have to write a, a paragraph for many of these questions. But I think given your deep insights, the, your uh, interlocutors will value your responses. So we look forward to having them completed, sent off, and then eventually finding a place on the ISG website. Thank you all. And I think and also, also, we'd like to thank uh, our technical team. Uh, and they have done a wonderful job in relaying all these uh, uh, webinars uh, almost uh, uh, nicely. I won't say flawlessly, but uh, we always try to improve the quality every time. And uh, we had some difficulty in our rehearsal time or trial time, but again, we could relate to this uh, uh, webinar uh, probably Very nicely. Nice. So thank you everyone. Again, uh, thank you Sun Pharma for supporting this activity. Uh, thank you everyone and bye-bye.